So um, we, within the technical session four, um, safe reinforcement learning, um, our first presenter is uh, Jinwoo Ro on uh, reinforcement learning with imperfect safety constraints. So uh, Jinwoo, if you uh, want to share. Is Jinwoo here? Uh, is is another of his team uh, prepared to present? Hmm. Okay. Um, if not, let's let's uh, move on to to the second one here. Um, uh, is P Peter Hay is here? Um, Peter. Um, would be presenting, uh, do androids dream of electric fences? Safety wear well, reinforcement learning with latent shielding. Hi, yeah, I was, let me get my presentation up. Okay. Uh, okay, screen sharing, where is that? Ah, oh, found it. Okay, cool. Can you all see my screen and hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. So, uh, in, so this is my talk. It's uh, safety aware reinforcement learning with latent shielding, um, and it's joint work between myself and uh, my colleagues at Imperial College London, Boya and Francesco. So, uh, here's a sneak peek of what's coming up. Um, essentially, on this slide, you can see two agents interacting with a simple visual environment. Essentially, the agents are these green circles. They're supposed to go to the black circles without touching the red squares. They get punished if they touch the red squares and rewarded if they reach the black circles. And um, as you can see, our agent avoids the red squares better. So we claim it's safer. Um, but before we go any further, we can't talk about safe RL without knowing what we mean by safe. So generally speaking, we mean that safe by safe, we mean that agents uh, generally satisfy the problems that bad the, the property that bad, bad things shouldn't happen. Um, what do we mean by bad things? Uh, it's essentially a bunch of states that we want to specify that the agent doesn't enter. And we can do this with uh, linear temporal logic, which is like the standard in verification. Um, so an example of a specification for this uh, particular setting would be not agent in red square until episode ended. In other words, just don't go in the red square. Um, and we can build a automaton to, so um, we can build an automaton to uh, monitor this and the procedure is relatively like well known. So it's, it's just from the runtime uh, verification literature. Um, but even with such a simple uh, specification, we find that a, a lot of like the state of the art agents. So this is a dreamer agent, which was released last year. Um, still can't satisfy this, uh, these constraints even after like 12 hours of training on a, G on a single GPU. And this does reflect some other work that was um, done by the Control and Verification Group at Oxford, which basically found that despite there being a positive correlation between reward satisf and satisfaction of like the safety constraints, um, a lot of agents, especially like the top performing deep reinforcement learning agents, violate these safety properties despite like it not being particularly sensible. Um, so essentially a lot of work has already gone into the area of safe RL and we're going to be looking at shielding, uh, which is the, the, the general area which uh, this work builds from. So we're all familiar, I hope, with the reinforcement learning loop. Essentially you've got an agent interacting with an environment and the environment gives the agent observations and rewards, and the agent gives the environment X action. Now, what the idea behind shielding is, is that we put the shield in between the agent and the environment, and the shield basically acts as a filter that uh, replaces unsafe actions with safe actions. And how do we know if an action is unsafe according to a shield? Uh, well, the way that they do it is you have a handcrafted abstraction of the environment, which is basically just a huge automaton, 
Um, and essentially what happens is you pull, the shield will then play like a two player safety game on this environment and automaton where the environment is player and tries to force the uh, agent into entering an unsafe state. And basically if, if the environment can win that game, then it's an unsafe state and the shield will intervene with a safe action, which can also be derived from the abstraction. Um, however, these abstractions are not always available, especially on like more complex high dimensional environments, for example, like the Atari games. So what some guys uh, at Oxford, so Jacobay and others basically did was instead of having a handcrafted version of the environment, abstraction of the environment, what they did was they just had, they used the emulator of the Atari games that they were testing their, their agents on and basically allowed it to uh, fast forward and rewind time. And with such privileged access to the environment, they could build these like trees of what might happen in the future up to some horizon. Um, unfortunately, a downside of this is firstly the fact that we don't normally have access to the emulator of the environment, especially if it's the real world. Although I hear that physicists are trying to change that, but also um, the search space grows exponentially with respect to the number of states with respect to the horizon. Um, so their definition of safety essentially is the safety up to a horizon where we say, given some finite trace of H steps, um, or n steps, we say that the and the set of all finite traces from a state, we basically say that a policy is safe if and only if, um, and then there are two conditions here. The first one is if there is a safe trace, then we take it. Otherwise, there are no safe traces and uh, we're screwed. So essentially, it's it's got like the if there are no safe traces, then we're we we can it's okay because it basically means that our horizon wasn't big enough and that's just the downside of having an h band safety so um our approach though is solves both of these problems um and essentially we do this by using a learned model of the environment so um the question is how do we learn a model of the environment and the answer is uh with model-based reinforcement learning so Model-based reinforcement learning has done a lot of work recently on the world model literature where you build a model of the world and of the environment and essentially one of the thing one of the big uh, papers in this area is called Dreamer which essentially proposes the following like training loop. The first one is you learn a model of the environment then you learn a policy inside the model of the environment um, you then use the policy that you learned in the environment to collect data in the real environment, and you repeat this until convergence. Um, what we do is, uh, in our approach, what we do is we use the we also use the model of the environment to keep the agents safe, and that's kind of like the the crux of what our work is based on. Um, so. The dreamer works are based on this idea of a recurrent state space model, which is basically a model of the environment that um, that essentially models like the environmental late dynamics in latent space. So essentially you have this deterministic, the state is decomposed into a deterministic and stochastic component. So H is the deterministic component and Z is the stochastic component. And effectively what happens is you, you have this model which um, models the dynamics through time. So we can condition um, our, so we can condition the model essentially on uh, a couple of observations and then we can predict what happens in the future. Um, and we call this feature like this, this prediction latent imagination. Um, what we do on top of what Dreamer does is we basically just add a classification of a label basically onto the states and we say, uh, is the state safe or not? And um, once we have this, what we can do is instead of having like a game or like the emulator or like a handcrafted of abstraction, instead what we can do is we can query our uh, safety recurrent state machine, I mean, recurrent state space model and um, imagine multiple possible futures. So that solves the problem of not having a handcrafted abstraction. Now, the second problem is the exponential explosion of like states that you have to explore and what we do is we um propose that we sort this out with an approx uh the idea of like approximating this 
So essentially the idea behind our approximated bounded prescience is that instead of sampling all of the possible trajectories, we bias our sampling process so that um, it's our, the sampling process will, more, will sample more traces that are more likely under the current policy. So essentially the idea is that we do not sample part, like paths that we know that our policy is not going to choose anyway. And using this, we can get incredible, like much, much, like we can achieve similar performance without uh, without the exponential blow up. Um, so, so we sample it basically by choosing the policy and sticking the noise term at the end. And we call this um, approximate bounded question shielding. Um, and, and essentially what we can do once we have these uh, imagined trajectories is that we can just check if any of them contain unsafe states and if they are like less than if the number of unsafe states or the proportion of total like imagined futures is, with unsafe states is less than some epsilon then we just choose the proposed action if not then we choose a backup action which is given by some safe safe uh, policy sigma um and yeah essentially it's it's like this so so the shield asks the uh, approximate bounded prescience whether or not um to, to look into the future and checks whether or not uh, the number of safety violations is less than epsilon. So essentially, this is how we do it. We have the uh, we learn the model of the environment. Um, we learn the policy inside the model of the environment, but this time we apply an intrinsic punishment to violation states. Uh, we collect data within the environment using the shield, and we repeat until convergence. And this leads to uh, better training time. This leads to fewer training violations and just generally better safety performance. But it's not all fun and games because what it turns out is that an inaccurate world mod internal model of the environment can lead to bad uh, explorations. So here's a concrete example. Imagine that our shield, which is now like an, a neural network model of the world, uh, is randomly initialized such that it thinks that this blue region is unsafe. Um, so, so what will happen is that um, during the initial exploration, while the agent will move up, realize that's unsafe, move to the left, realize that's unsafe, and move down, and realize that's unsafe. But um, once, uh, or move down and realize it's safe. But once it gets to the down, it realizes that moving left is unsafe, and that's just due to the random initialization of the shield, which is bad. So essentially what you end up with is uh, strange behaviors like this where the agent is too scared because the shield has been, it was initialized just randomly said that like safe bits, bits of safe space were unsafe and therefore the agent never gets to learn that these like unsafe states, quote unquote, are actually safe. Uh, so what we do is we propose the shield introduction schedule, which basically means don't start shielding until you've learned a proper environment, like a proper model of the world. Um, so potential implementations, you can have a gradually decaying probability of disabling the shield. You can enable the shield once the loss has like plateaued and a couple of other things. So here are the performance evaluations. We evaluate across the couple of benchmarks. Here's three. Um, bounded pressing shielding, which is like a formal verification method. It's basically guaranteed to work, but as you can see in the second seed, it leads to some weird behavior, um, which is the, the uh, poor initialization of the model. Um, in latent shielding, which uses the shield introduction schedules, you, which is our approach, you can see that we're pretty good. And without, in our baseline, without any shielding, you can see that it basically just ignores like the safety constraint. Um, here are some loss curves, and uh, here are the table. You can see this in the paper, but basically we also benchmark against CPO, which is this uh, model free approach. And uh, essentially, like even though it does have its uh, advantages, one disadvantage of the model free approach is that you need a lot more interactions with the actual environment in order to actually to learn anything of use. Um, we examine the latent dynamics. So we see that um, our, our model seems to like capture the specifically, specifically captures the bits of the environment that are bad. Um, sorry, I was just checking the chat. Um, and so, so essentially, and, um, we have a couple of open questions. So how, what's the best shield introduction schedule? How might we leverage uncertainty? How might we leverage offline pre-training? 
And um, I guess the takeaways are we've introduced latent shielding. It's, it's pretty cool because you don't need the abstraction of the uh, environment first. Uh, we can do this by basically learning the abstraction of the environment and that shielding can harm model-based reinforcement learning algorithms. So uh, the takeaway on that side front is basically to introduce the shield gently with the shield introduction schedule. And that's, that's basically it. Awesome. Th thank you so much, Peter. Um, our next talk is, uh, we'll have uh, Ji Kang Zhang um, talk about a hierarchical framework for safe reinforcement learning. Um, you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, the paper I'm going to introduce today is High Theory, a Hierarchical Framework for Safe Reinforcement Learning. Uh, I'm Zikang Xiong, and uh, they said a joint work with Ishika and my advisor, Suresh. Uh, so um, the first question is why do we need a hierarchical framework? So uh, it is well known that deep reinforcement learning can control a complex uh, uh, robot in high dimension uh, and make it to um, um, make some, some behavior like run fast. Um, however, um, when it comes to complex tests, uh, non-hierarchical reinforcement learning uh, does not work. For example, if we want to navigate a robot to go across a maze, if you simply encode all those things into a reward and optimize it with, with a deep reinforcement learning, uh, usually it will not uh, guide the robot to go to the final goal. It may stuck at some place. Um, so in this case, um, what people usually will do is to introduce a hierarchical framework. Um, for example, you can always learn a high level policy to guide the robot almost most straightforwardly, you can directly apply a traditional planner like RT and A star to generate a pass plan that guides the robot to go to the final goal. And on the low level, um, since the controller can to train it to achieve some very simple tasks like run fast, like going to a point in a straight way, um, you can use a low level controller to guide the robot to follow the plan. So uh, the problem we care about is um, how do we provide safety guarantee or safety enhancement in this uh, hierarchical framework. So uh, one observation is that uh, usually uh, some, many times you can always make a safe plan. Uh, for example, you can always draw an RT algorithm to generate a collision free pass. Uh, but so when you really use the controller to follow the plan, the controller does not necessarily always follow it. And this can cause pro problems. Um, for example, in the red graph, there are three plans generated by a planner. And then when you really use a controller to follow the plan, um, because when during the planning, uh, the planner does not care about anything about the low level controller. So um, it's not, not necessary that the controller will follow the plan exactly and uh, uh, a result might be co uh, collision may happen. So uh, our framework addressed this problem, this problem about the inc inconsistency between the plan and the control. So um, we also consider a, a two level structure so in the low level, um, we have a low level controller and uh, on the high level, we have a high level planner. And the low level controller is trained by a uh, deep reinforcement learning. Um, uh, for example, in this, in, uh, in this graph, we want to train a sweeping robot to, uh, to arrive the charger as fast as possible. 
In the meantime, we will collect data um, and uh, use those data to train a neural algorithm function, which will be introduced in the next slide. Um, after we get the low level controller, um, what we will do is we will uh, firstly make a plan in a complex environment with a planner. Uh, for example, in the animation here, um, we make a plan, which is those green light here to guide the robot go to the final goal. And uh, um, the controller is used to follow this plan. However, uh, as we can observe that when the controller really follows the plan, it's oscillate a lot around this plan. And this can be really dangerous, especially uh, when there are lots of obstacles around it. So uh, um, our problem is um, how can we actually bond uh, this robot to stay in a certain region around the plan so that during planning, we can also um, enlarge the planning, um, to the collision detection during the planning. And then in this case, we can ensure uh, our boundary can provide certain uh, certain guarantee that our robot will not hit with any obstacle. So uh, to do this, um, we use the neural algorithm function we learned to build such region, uh, we call it region of attraction. And this also widely used in uh, the control theory. So uh, in next slide, uh, we can say some detail about how do we build this region of attraction. So, um, so the first step is um, we need to train the low level controller as we discussed. Uh, basically, it's similarly use a deep IL to minimize uh, uh, cumulative rewards. Um, and then uh, we will sample data from the controller we train and use those data to train the neural algorithm function. So basically, a neural function is just uh, three constraints. Uh, the first constraint is um, in a stabilized state x0, um, it always has value zero. Um, and uh, the second question is, for any state that is not in this stabilized state, the Lyapunov function is always greater than zero. And the third question is, um, the Lyapunov function is always decreased over time. So, uh, uh, we can encode all those, those three constraints into a layup node risk, and then simply by minimizing this layup node risk, we can uh, train a neural layup node function. Um, so uh, one important intuition for the layup node function is uh, since it will always decrease over the time. Uh, for example, at the beginning, if we specify a value in the z axis, uh, for example, we specify a uh, uh, constant here, uh, constant here. Um, so as time goes, since the value will always decrease, so uh, the the reachable set of um, the reachable set will always be bounded below the region. Um, uh, will always bounded below the level we specify. Uh, if we project this level into an the x y um, plan, we will uh, we will find that uh, actually we can bond it our uh, robot with a uh, region of attraction. So uh, so uh, so uh, one thing we still need to uh, observe that is um, all the process actually just uh, regarding sample data to train uh, um, to train. Uh, controller and sample data to train a neural diagonal function. So actually we do not require the low level dynamics of a system. So our approach is model free. Um, after get the neural diagonal function, uh, what we can do is we can actually uh, place all those uh, region of attraction we build around the plan and use the plan to uh, uh, and they use the region of traction to bound the robot to stay around the plan. So um, here is some benchmarks we evaluated. Uh, although all those benchmarks are in really low dimension, uh, the most complicated them uh, only have eight dimension is uh, this car robot. Uh, but uh, 
since there are lots of uh, unsafe states that can happen, so uh, so it, it still can cause lots of violations. Um, so, um, yeah, um, so, so here is some simple result about this. So um, if we only guide the system with the low level controller and without consider the region of attraction we built, uh, it will have lots of safety violation. But if we protect it with the region of attraction we built, uh, we can significantly improve the safety. And uh, uh, more recently, we have um, scaled our approach to more complicated environment. Uh, so all those, those environments have a um, large degree of freedoms and also high dimensional space, um, high dimensional observation space. For example, for the dog or robot here, um, it has uh, observation space higher than 80. And uh, um, also another challenge is uh, actually, all those input for the uh, for our system is uh, can be some implicit observation like your know, LiDAR data, and this can actually bring lots of challenges for traditional LiDAR approach, and that's uh, why our approach can be a very attractive way to solve this problem. And um, uh, the last thing I want to say is, um, as we can see, there are lots of uh, blue obstacle in the, in the map. So actually it's very easy to violate safety constraint. However, our, our approach can actually scale very well in those environments. So summarize, uh, we propose a model free hierarchical framework for safe reinforcement learning. And um, uh, we safely combine the planning and the control. Um, also, uh, this is based on a learning-based Lyapunov learn function and the neural uh, region of attraction. Um, and uh, uh, we place all those um, the functions, function, uh, all those region of attraction around the plan. And uh, uh, this requires sequ sequentially showed, uh, which we have introduced in the paper. And uh, um, we also uh, deploy it, um, deploy it as a trained agent in complex environments and uh, uh, this environment is really safety sensitive. And uh, we have shown that our approach can uh, give significantly safe, uh, safety improvement. Um, and also there are some other experiments uh, provided in paper. For example, um, our approach is also robust to uh, certain adverse attacks. And also uh, we also have some runtime planning pass repel uh, introduced in paper. So um, that's all for this paper. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Shikong. Um, so actually, um, so Jinwoo has, uh, has joined the session again. So we're going to go back to the first paper. Um, so I'd like to in introduce uh, Jinwoo Ro, uh, who will be presenting on uh, reinforcement learning with imperfect safety constraints. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. I will share my uh, slide. Okay. Sorry for the schedule things. I I, I miscomputed the uh, time. Anyway, so let me start first. So uh, my name is Jinu uh, from University of Bamberg in Germany. I will briefly present my work on reinforcement learning with imperfect safety constraints. Since the time is short, so I will just focus on the delivering the overall idea of the research while the detailed information can be found in the paper. In control systems like cyber physical systems, we deploy distributed controllers in the environment to manage the physical processes. However, um, the, sometimes the underlying dynam environment dynamics may be not fully known to us or can change dynamically. In such cases, the conventional control approaches cannot deal with unexpected events in the environment. Therefore, reinforcement learning is considered to improve control decision-making process through online learning. Example applications uh, include uh, Mars rover, NASA, underwater robots, and self-driving cars, and there are more examples. 
As you can notice, these applications are safety critical and also mission critical, which means that the system needs to ensure safety requirements. Ensuring safety in reinforcement learning is generally formulated as a constraint satisfaction problem. To least well-known approaches in the literature, first we have reverse shaping. In this approach, we have different rewards also for safety and control separately. And the final decision making is based on the sum of rewards. And there is also another approach called safe policy extraction, which uses safety monitor to detect and block unsafe control actions. So we have system and then uh, safety monitor, and then this monitor observe the state of the system and action to be chosen. And it determines whether that is safe or not. And lastly, we have constraint Markov decision process, CMDP. Also has a separate reward for safety. So it has a reward for control policy, a reward for safety separately. But the difference between reward shaping and CMDP is that in CMDP, uh, this re uh, safety reward is constraint. So basically we choose an action that the safety reward is over some threshold. So basically this is a constraint. So the idea of our research uh, problem starts from the fact that the safety constraints are invariant in such existing approaches. So we talked about reinforcement learnings is good for uh, uh, unknown environment or dynamically changing environment, right? So the safety constraint, if it is invariant, then we need to make sure this uh, constraint is designed properly in the, in the development time. And also when, when uh, this environment changes dynamic, dynamically over time, we need to account the, the such changes in the design time, which is very difficult. And also there could be some unexpected situations, for example, the controller becomes worn out or damaged. So therefore the safety constraint may no, no longer be correct. So it becomes incorrect. In this sense, we intuitively say that the safety constraints can be imperfect, imperfect safety constraints. So the research problem is to capture the missing unsafe states that the safety monitor or constraint fail to detect. So, so for convenience, we will just call such states, such missing states as hidden unsafe states okay, in, our, in our presentation. Consider an inverse pendulum system as a motivating example. First, there is a bar which can rotate about the anchor. There are two variables the angle theta and the angular velocity omega. These makes up the two dimensional state space. There is a controller based on reinforcement learning to push the bar left or right to make the bar never fall down. Here, a safety monitor can be designed to detect unsafe system states. Let's say although this inverse pendulum system is very simple, but let's say uh, uh, we, we design the safety monitor with, uh, uh, with limited knowledge, say the safety monitor is input. Okay. So here, as you can see on the right top corner, uh, the safety monitor only considers the angle to specify unsafe states. For instance, however, the magnitude of angular velocity is also takes in place when we want to uh, consider safety because even if we are over a certain threshold, uh, even if we are not yet exceeded the certain threshold, the angular velocity can push the bar towards the unsafe state. Uh, so therefore, um, on the right-hand bottom corner, we have state visualized state space. The horizontal axis is the angle and the vertical axis is the angular velocity. The region colored in red indicate the set of states 
which the safety monitor detects as unsafe. Okay, so red means unsafe, basically. The regions in yellow are the states where the, the bar is considered as safe by the safety monitor. However, these are actually unsafe because of the angular velocity, uh, it pushes the bar to the unsafe state. So if the system is in yellow region, then it is guaranteed that the bar will eventually fall down in the future. So there is no way that the control can recover. So, uh, so however, such uh, the yellow regions are recognized as safe by the safety monitor. This is actually first negative detection by this safety monitor. And this should be avoided when we are considering safety of the system. So our goal is to find this yellow region, which is not detected by the safety monitor, but using the reinforcement learning, we want to extend this constraint, the, the red region, to cover this yellow region effectively. So our approach to this problem is using a dedicated reinforcement learning component, namely safety estimator. In the diagram, we can see a feedback loop between environment and the controller. This is the conventional reinforcement learning feedback loop. So reward and state and, and the feedback. On the right bottom corner, we have safety estimator. It takes state, action, and the, the result of safety monitor as the input. Basically, the safety estimator is learning from safety monitor. But using the system state and action, it can detect false negative detections of safety monitor by comparing it with safe, uh, the system state. So if the, state, uh, if the safety monitor says it's safe, but we can also compare with the, the current system state, and then if, if it is actually unsafe, then we know that this is false negative detection. So, um, so the safety estimator tries to learn such uh, false negative detection, so-called uh, hidden unsafe state. For the learning of safety estimator, we modify the Bellman from our equation. Uh, however, due to the limited time, we are not going to uh, uh, see the equation here, but please refer to our paper for more. Note that the learning process of controller and safety estimator are independent. So we have controller part, which is running by itself, has also its independent learning process. And on the other hand, we have safety estimator, which is, has also its own learning process. The experimental result shows that safety estimator actually improves, improves the learning of the controller by a faster, by providing faster conversions to the best reward. If you see the line graph below, the line, uh, the total reward of each episode is 200, and then we have 500 episodes in the experiment. Note that the reward is given by the length of time the system did not fail. So maximum reward means that the system completed the episode without any safety violation. Blue line is the conventional D2N. Red line is our approach with a single experience buffer. And the black line is, the, is with the double buffer. Here, the difference between single and double buffers is how we store the uh, training data. So in single buffer case, all training data is, uh, are stored in a single buffer. And in double buffer case, the uh, safe state of the system and then unsafe state of the system, those data are separately stored in two buffers. So the reason behind of using two buffers is that when we use a single buffer, the unsafe system state data in the buffer can be overwritten by safe data because this buffer is keep getting the data from the environment if we have uh, uh, safe data for a long time, say, then we don't have any more unsafe data in the buffer. 
So this training data with only biased information can lead to incorrect learning. That's why we want to have two buffers, one for unsafe data and one, the other for safe data. The black line here shows faster convergence to the best reward, as we can see, and also for good maintenance of the reward over epic data. Compared to DQN, which is the blue line, the number of safety violation episodes are reduced by 37%. So in this slide, we visualize how safety estimator interprets. This is the uh, this state space. The red region indicates the set of states where uh, the safety estimator recognized as unsafe. And blue is region where it think as safe. If you remember the state space, state space diagram with yellow and red regions in the previous slide, here the safety estimator is learning well in terms of detecting all possible unsafe states, meaning that we are now also capturing this yellow region as of red in this diagram. However, since safety estimator is essentially based on reinforcement learning, the uncertainty of learning results in a shrink of red region. In particular, if you look at episode 420, the area of yellow, uh, red region becomes uh, smaller compared to the previous episode. This, this leads to an, an underestimation of the unsafe states. And then this is why the black line in the previous slide was fluctuating when it comes to the uh, maximum reward. And it, it, it doesn't maintain this maximum reward forever, but it fluctuates slightly because the red region in the safety meter here it is more or less up and down because of the uncertainty of the line. So in conclusion, we addressed the problem of dealing with an imperfect safety monitor or constraint. Our approach used safety estimator, which is a separate reinforcement learning component in the system to detect false negative detections of the safety monitor. The experiment result shows that our approach can faster the controller's learning process by reducing the safety violations. We are currently investigating how to ensure that what um, okay, how to ensure um, that the result of safety estimator is an overall approximation of the safe states, and also to extract information from the reinforcement the, the safety estimator to update the safety monitor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jinmu. Um, so we'll be moving on uh, quickly here to our last uh, presenter of the session. Um, so uh, Matthew Gobo, please uh, please uh, share your screen. Uh, he'll be presenting a game theoretic perspective on risk sensitive reinforcement learning. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, uh, here is my work uh, named uh, A Game Theoretic Perspective on Risk Sensitive Reinforcement Learning. This is uh, work done with my colleagues Maxime Eurier, Sharat Chandra, Rupali Bati, and uh, my supervisor Audrey Zurin. Uh, joint work between the IID Institute and uh, Mira. So recall reinforcement learning. I know we've seen a few presentations about RL, but like in RL, we have an agent that interacts with an environment. The agent outputs actions and receives rewards uh, corresponding to the action. And what we can define for the uh, uh, an agent pi is that we have a return, which is j of pi. That is the sum over all, uh, all returns. And j of, of pi may look like a random, uh, may have some kind of uh, CDF uh, which is like, because it's a random variable due to the agent being stochastic or the environment ha having stochasticity in it. Now the classical RL objective is to do expectation maximization. So we usually hope to find uh, the policy that maximizes its expectation. So if we have two policies on the right, pi and pi prime with two different return distributions, then uh, what you would do is you would compute the expectation and take the one with the, the largest expectation. Uh, 
So in this case, uh, if the expectation is in green, you would uh, select the top the the top policy as it's uh, as it has a, a higher expectation. However, in cases like uh, clinical treatment suggestion, this uh, this type of uh, of decision making may be uh, may be suboptimal because, uh, for instance, if we consider the top policy here on the on the right as uh, giving morphine to a patient and the, the other one as giving a small smaller painkiller, then if the return is something like uh, on the right you have the patient does not feel any pain because she's on morphine, so it's uh, it, it, they're okay with no, they, they don't feel any pain. But on the right, there is a slight chance that the patient uh, develops a dependency to morphine, and there is a large uh, a large negative reward incurred. And if you are in, if you only have like a, a natural and normal painkiller, usual painkiller, then you would you would not have you would always have a small degree of pain for the patient, but never the uh, really on the really catastrophic scenario where one patient becomes uh, dependent on uh, on a drug. So uh, we, we usually want to avoid the uh, riskier scenario which we have on, on top here. And one way to do so is to uh, to optimize for a risk sensitive uh, metric instead of the risk neutral uh, expectation. So uh, the uh, risk sensitive metric could be, for instance, uh, the conditional value at risk which is defined as the expectation over the worst alpha tail of a policy, which is like you have the mathematical formulation here. And what we would do in CVAR RL is simply instead of taking the policy that maximizes the expectation, you, you take the policy that maximizes the uh, CVAR. And then CVAR is defined with respect to an alpha because as I said, you want to optimize over uh, uh, over worst alpha tail. So if you select a smaller alpha, then you want to optimize over the, the, the more rare yet possibly more catastrophic scenarios. So the smaller the alpha, then the more risk sensitive the policy you will get uh, in, in turn. If we come back to our two policies, what this means is that if you take, for instance, I, I computed alpha uh, at 0.2, then what you will get is uh, you would select the, the policy on the bottom because it has a higher CVAR alpha, which is in green here. So this is how you can see a small visual example of why CVAR, uh, CVAR RL is risk sensitive and y y yields uh, more, uh, more risk averse uh, policies. Now, uh, in the literature, uh, approaches exist for doing CVAR RL. But uh, all existing approaches rely on distributional RL methods when we scale them to deep reinforcement learning. So uh, one, one potential issue is that these approaches are not guaranteed to converge over their whole distribution output. In turn, this means that we cannot provide theoretical guarantees on the selection of true optimal risk sensitive policies. So there is kind of a theory gap with using a distributional RL for risk sensitive uh, objectives. So what we do in our paper is we propose uh, to move away from the distributional perspective and instead, of, uh, instead adopt a game theoretic perspective. In our game theoretic perspective, what we do is we propose a game uh, between an agent, the protagonist here on top, and an antagonist uh, we have at the bottom here, where the antagonist has the goal to minimize the, uh, the protagonist's uh, reward. So, um, in, in our case, what, what happens is that the uh, antagonist is directly linked with the environment. You can see it as an adversary being in, inside the environment and it, it perturbs the next state transitions. How does it do that? Is that it pr produces perturbations delta t's uh, and it aims to minimize the protagonist rewards doing so. How are uh, the perturbations taken into account? Uh, they are multiplicative. So what this means is that uh, you transition to next states using, uh, using state transition PT in usual RL. In our game, what we do is we have a multiplicative, uh, multiplicative uh, perturbation. So if PT is a vector over next space, let's say uh, we have 30 states, then PT is a vector in, uh, in R30, and then the delta T is also a vector in R30, and you do the element-wise uh, multiplications. And what happens is that once the transition has been sampled from the perturb transitions p hat, then what we do is uh, we can update the antagonist 
we can see the antagonist impact on the uh, transition by simply uh, looking at what the antagonist uh, had had in mind for the the next state sample, and we can uh, implement doing so uh, an eta perturbation uh, budget. So the adversary has to uh, to be constrained to uh, to move to to only move the trajectory by a maximum amount of eta uh, over the whole uh, whole trajectory. Um, now, uh, what happens is that uh, this means we have a maximum uh, game, which is we want to find, uh, we want a, a policy which maximizes the reward and, uh, and an adver adversary which minimizes it. And here we have, we, we just pose uh, J of eta uh, pi lambda, which is uh, the expectation of, uh, of return over the, uh, the, the, the adversarial dynamics we just described earlier here. Um, so what happens is that the solution concept of this game is its equilibrium point, which is the, the minimax equilibrium. And at this point, we have pi star, which is the argmax over C var of, it, of its return. So what this means is that when we solve the game we, uh, we presented earlier, we will find a C var optimal policy. And actually, the fun fact we have here is that the fun result we have is that the, uh, the exact alpha quantile for which the, the optimal policy, the, the resulting policy will be optimized for is directly linked with the adversary budget via one over eta. So what this means is that in high stakes scenario where we may have a specific alpha objective in mind, as is done in finance, for instance, uh, this means we can just set the budget accordingly to, uh, to optimize the desired objective. So this is a, a straightforward way to yield exactly uh, uh, to, to, to yield true uh, CVAR optimal policies, uh, at least in theory. Um, now what we, what we want to do is we want to use this with deep reinforcement learning. So we want to, uh, to derive the gradient updates. The one issue with this is that updating each player naively is unstable due to the non-stationarity of games. So since one agent's reward is dependent on the, on the adversary, then uh, we cannot just uh, update each other because we may end up in a, uh, non-converging scenario. So what we do is we cast our game as a Stackelberg game. And without going too in-depth because details are in the paper, a Stackelberg game takes for granted that there is a leader and a follower. And the follower is always, always constitutes the best response with respect to the leader. So uh, this, this yields the, uh, the bi-level optimization problem. Where we uh, where we want to find the argmax of pi, but we always take for granted that the uh, that the uh, follower, so the adversary, is optimal with respect to the current pi. And uh, yeah, I'm seeing I'm kind of low on time, so I'll just go quickly over this. How we do this is in practice we sample trajectories from the uh, the adversarial dynamics I described earlier, and then what we do is we simply update either theta or omega, so either the adversary, the protagonist or the antagonist uh, by, uh, according to, uh, to the Stackelberg algorithms. So what we do is we just do many uh, gradient steps of the antagonist in between uh, gradient steps of the protagonist. And uh, we have some small, uh, some small empirical results on the grid world environment. In this grid world environment, what we have is we have an agent on the top left, a goal on the top right where, we have, where the agent receives a large reward. We have lava spaces in, in between. And there is always a 5% chance that the environment executes a random action. So the agent uh, will want to, uh, to move away from, the, from lava as much as possible to reach the, the green square. But since there is a step cost at every time step, then the agent wants to, uh, has to balance between moving away and incurring large step cost. Uh, between uh, moving closer to lava and incurring possibly uh, falling in the lava. So we test on three different budget criterions, which respectively correspond to CVAR1, which is the expectation maximization, CVAR0.04, and CVAR0.01. And what we see is that the more we, uh, we augment the adversary budget, the more the, uh, the policy that is produced is uh, learns to move away from the lava. So we are pretty happy with, with this. This is the, uh, the, expected, uh, the expected behavior. Uh, although we see that there, there are instability issues in our training procedure. So this is left for future work to try to uh, optimize for this. 
So uh, in conclusion, we propose the new risk sensitive RL method for CVAR, uh, which does not require RL algorithms. Uh, we prove that there, there is a theoretical uh, asymptotical convergence of our method to true CVAR optimal policies. So we, uh, we, we remove the gap that, it, that is in the current distribution RL where we don't have uh, theoretical guarantees. And uh, lastly, we think that this whole game theoretic perspective may yield the uh, other interesting results because we think that our framework is flexible enough to be applied on other risk measures than CVAR. So uh, this may be uh, this may be very interesting for uh, other work. And uh, this is it. So thank you, thank, uh, you. thank you all for your listening. Th thank you so much, Matthew. Um, so we are running slightly behind schedule. Um, what we'll do is we'll we'll uh, expect extend the debate panel um, until uh, the uh, 40 uh, minute mark. So we'll have a full 15 minutes for the debate panel. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the stage um, all the um, paper authors, um, uh, including uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, and I'd also like to invite uh, discussants, uh, Ben Bucknell, uh, John Burden, and Gabriel uh, Petroza. So discussants, I welcome you to uh, ask questions of the authors. Hi, uh, yeah, so I, I have one for, for Peter. You're, you're a little bit low, John, if you could. Oh, uh, is that better? The yes. microphone is cool. Um, yeah, so I have a question for Peter about, uh, in the paper, the, um, the environment that was used uh, with the sort of the safety grid world, there was a sort of punishment for entering the red square in terms of reward. So I was wondering whether this method could still be applied like effectively in environments where we don't necessarily know about the safety constraints uh, in terms of, you know, is the agent actively, uh, dissu you know, actively dissuaded from uh, doing the safety thing? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely is the answer. So essentially, um, I treat the safety constraint and reward as separate like entities. Um, what happens is even though, so the, there is a punishment for, for in the environment for going onto the red square, but that's only to make sure that the, that we have like a somewhat fair comparison with, for example, the, the agents where there isn't such a constraint. In our agent, we do have an intrinsic punishment where essentially you, we, 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 during the training inside the latent world model, we also apply punishments um, when the safety violation. So it's like an augmented reward function, basically. Cool, cool. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Jin Wu, actually. Um, so in, in part of your, your section on the motivation behind your work, talking about, um, you know, if there's incomplete knowledge of unsafe states in the environment, you also mentioned um, sort of dynamic environments where the unsafe states may, may change, some new, some states may become unsafe. Um, but if I remember correctly, that's not something you really touched upon in what followed. Is, is that something that you're looking into, applying your, your method to these more sort of dynamic environments? And, uh, and well, you, how, uh, how would that work? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, should be. So basically, my uh, intention was that the environment, so we have safety constraints, right? And then we just usually say that this constraint has to be valid all of, all, always during the runtime, right? But because of the dynamical change in the environment, maybe the constraint may be designed, specified incorrectly from the beginning, say that it doesn't capture the environment uh, unsafe states fully. So it underestimates, basically. So this can be due to incorrect design or can be due to environment being changed. So I'm not particularly targeting environment being changed, but I'm more like filling the unknown knowledge in the in the system. And and that's that can easily go both ways in terms of uh, if you underestimated 
uh, in terms of the safety constraints. So is in there, there are states that are unsafe that you don't know about. Can, can your method equally account for states which are initially thought to be unsafe, but then uh, end up actually being safe? So basically, I, uh, in conceptually, what you want to do is you want to have a set of unsafe states that you can uh, you can predict. Okay, you know, uh, you have some prediction of unsafe states, but this is incorrect. So you want to extend this. So overall approximation is always good because if we don't care about overall approximation because it's always safe. It's overly unsafe. Uh, if it's overly safe, uh, maybe degrade the performance, but in terms of safety, it's okay, right? But our concern is underestimation. When it comes to underestimation, we want to extend this constraint boundary to have this uh, unknown area covered, right? So this is where the reinforcement learning kicks in, in my approach. Yeah, for sure. It makes sense to to err uh, on the side of um, being too cautious, for sure. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay, uh, I would like to address a question for Bonnie. I think that we have uh, interesting discussions after your talk, but uh, I'm still uh, wondering about the root, the root causes that you were discussing in your presentation, uh, mainly regarding the completeness of those root causes. Uh, how can you proceed? What's the perspective there? And also about the independences uh, the independence between those uh, root causes, because actually we know that uh, we we aim to find the root cause or something, but uh, what are the guarantees that we have we already found it? Well, and I think we're just on the tip of the iceberg in terms of looking at you know military safety or AI systems for for these kind of military situations. For example, like it took us a whole year just to look at three specific you know military scenarios and their different um, excursions to try and identify you know what are the realm of possible safety errors and it's like you said you know yes some some one root, root, root problem could cause others so if there's a problem within the system with bad data that could easily lead to the human machine interaction problems and on and on so it's like cascading failures and so the bottom line is that you know we 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 brainstormed up a, a set that's probably not complete. And I think, um, you know, several of the folks had some really great comments here about, you know, test sufficiency and how do you know, you know, we can't even start to really talk about test sufficiency until we've started to even imagine what the different scenario sufficiencies are. So have we even imagined all of the different military scenarios that an AI system might operate in? Um, you know, before we before we even think in terms of how are we going to test them, and then another question might be, you know, is simulation good enough? And that's a big concern also within the Navy and DoD. So yes, we can spend a lot of time trying to simulate these different scenarios, but that's different than ca than capturing real world data to train our machine learning systems, and then eventually real world tests to test once these AI kinds of decision aids get to the point of, of deployment. So I guess what I'm doing is probably asking more questions and identifying more challenges than I am offering solutions. And at this point, I think it's just trying to become aware of these things and aware that there's, you know, like today, there's a whole realm of, uh, of smart folks out there that are studying all kinds of different strategies for this. And so my job is trying to, you know, try to get my mind wrapped around some of them and get them connected and basically just tell our, you know, DOD at the higher level, this is a, this is a real, <laughs> this is a real concern as we wildly go out and, you know, spend a lot of money on a lot of different AI applications. Are we also thinking about what kind of new failure modes and can we even engineer these systems safely and what kind of new, you know, test infrastructure or ways of thinking about testing them or ways and thing you know or just the problem of uh, i think someone mentioned you know not necessarily being able to establish requirements and set those in stone before we go off and start designing and developing them and that's a that's a major paradigm shift that i think that the systems engineering community is just starting to understand that it's even a challenge or understand that we're dealing with a non-deterministic system when we've been used in the past to um, 
to dealing with the deterministic system. So those are just some thoughts at this point and where we're at. So thank well, you, Gabriel. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Yeah. Uh, there is a hand raised. Jean, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a question to Matthew. Matthew. Uh, yes. So my question, uh, well, I, actually, I have two questions, but one is small. But uh, so, did you increase the eta to like very large values? So, for example, in your case study, if you, you only showed on up to one hundred ten, what happens up to one thousand or ten thousand, for example? Um, this is not something we've done uh, yet because. In those cases, you're optimizing for such a smaller portion of your of your tail that it basically amounts to like worst case optimization of uh, of, of the uh, of the RL objective. So it's something we did not do, but I think it would be interesting to to try because if you have like a one thousand budget, then your your adversary can basically do whatever it wants with the yeah with the exactly in the beginning. So yeah. so my next question is to be how do you determine this eta value in in any application? For example, I mean if you increase the eta value, which is budget, then apparently the control reward because you are going larger trajectory, right? The performance becomes degrading, right? So how do I know like the compensation in terms of how do you determine this eta value? Yeah, well, what we what we think is that from a decision maker standpoint, uh, it's actually easier to think of the eta value as uh, uh, in the reverse by uh, uh, choosing the alpha you want to optimize for CVAR. But like optimizing for CVAR 0.1 or CVAR 0.5 is something you have to kind of like take your mind into and, and think it's you want to optimize for over the worst 50%. So it's like um, let's say I, I have an, uh, an ML agent I want to deploy in practice, then I, I want to, uh, to make sure that uh, in the unlikely events, which are maybe uh, I want the unlikely event to be 50% of the time, then it, it, it's still very, uh, very good. So this is kind of like left to the, uh, to the decision maker when, when they implement, like choose alpha and then eta follows uh, implicitly. Okay. All right. I, I have a quick question for, for Matthew. Uh, do you have a theory on why um, there were um, instabilities in, in your methods? Um, could it be from the Stackelberg formulation or, or do you think it's just from the RL training methods? Um, from what we, we tried, we did try some uh, other, uh, after the paper, we tried some other methods for baselines and we, we found that uh, other uh, safe RL baselines have the same uh, instability. And what we, what we argue is that it's probably linked to our representation because we use, uh, their real grid world representation where the agent takes as input x y and only uh, only receives uh, the reward so the if the agent never samples the goal then the agent never knows there is a goal on the top right so what we found is policies that don't converge to the to learning the goal like the u shape are usually policies that don't see the goal enough in the training phase so that's something we could we could probably like uh, change by using a, 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 an image representation and scaling up larger networks Thanks. So I, I, if nobody else has questions, I have a question for, for Peter. Um, so with the decay of the, the shield over time, uh, one would think that less frequent problems would seem to occur more frequently than they might otherwise need to um, if the shield were, were smarter. Um, C could we make the shield smarter and more persistent? Uh, sorry, I didn't really get what you're asking. Um, so, so, so it seemed like you were recommending um, some some decay of the shield over time, right? Oh, uh, yeah. So that was I. I suggest that what we do is we decay the probability of disabling the shield over time. So that that basically means enable it more as time progresses. And the reason for that is if the shield is poorly initialized due to a poor like model of the environment that the agent has, then what happens is that the shield will therefore like block things that would actually be safe and that would actually be useful for um, exploration. And therefore, uh, what we do is we try to ensure that an accurate model of the environment is learned before we turn on the shield full time. So, um, so is this then only applicable for closed world models? 
uh, in terms of so in terms of closed world what do you mean by closed world models um uh, in an agent operating in in a fixed environment as opposed to one that uh, could could change arbitrarily over arbitrary uh, uh so we've is so we have tried it over um like random initializations of the grid world uh which which kind of just show that like the the network like the visual encoder network that represents the states is robust but it's essentially like if if the if the latent world model can actually learn it, learn like that sort of representation if it's reasonable to assume that that's such a the world model should be able to generalize to that um it should in theory work but if that makes sense uh but, but it's still a fixed finite environment uh yeah so so i uh i guess i'm asking about sort of an infinite environment uh, if if it depends, it very much depends on the environment itself. Because if you can like, if it's like an if it's like one of those endless runner games where it's just the same stuff but procedurally generated, then we I would expect it that it would work. However, if it's something like uh, some when you introduce a totally new entity that wasn't seen during training, I I don't think that it would work because the the networks it's just a neural network it's like learning inductively which means that like if, if it hasn't seen some, a situation before then i don't think we can expect it to be able to uh accurately deal with it all right thank you